Batman lovers. Whispers in the Sea is an actual play series drawing elements from stories of fantasy horror, political drama, and swashbuckling action and adventure pirate stories. As such, a list of content warnings will always be made available in the description. Nope. You stay still. That's probably a bad idea. Yes, stay still. Especially while I have the needle in you. Oh, you got a needle. Ah! <laughs> Don't look. You won't know when I pierce you if you do not look. I won't. Ah! <laughs> you hear Fontaneva go. She put all of us in danger. I don't think you understand that. What would have happened if she had fired? Um, well, it seems to be some sort of... Well, Captain Hanno called it a map, but... It's but a riddle so far, but I believe there's more. Is it as straightforward as it seems? I don't know if you feel it, but the ship has a bit of a tingle, a hum to it, if you will. This also has a tingle, a hum. I can feel it the same way. It's not as strong, for sure, but it's there. As you finish tracing the box around the name Jacques, you feel your hand pull forward where the tip of your quill is like pressing into the map now, and it redraws it, leaving behind a red mark as dark and crimson as blood. And you begin to feel yourself moved across from left to right across the page until at the end of it, there is a map. This isn't a mere ship of cutthroats and, and thieves. Call it concerned that uh, you might be guiding me to somewhere, to something that uh, I'm not entirely equipped to handle. You will play your part, as we all do. And maybe, just maybe, if you trust me, you'll learn a thing or two. But for now, all you have to do is be here. I don't want to run into the Espinoran Navy, that's for sure. Speaking of which, we've already done that. That was, um, not that, great. Yes. Captain, while we do put ourselves at risk on this ship, we also have reasons, good reasons, in theory, as to why we do that. Felix, we burned a ship. Yes. A fellow pipe. Yes. Don't do it. Again. Who brought this map back to the ship? Who brought more coin than anyone else? Map and coin mean nothing if we don't have our own. And this is the wishy-washy bullshit that I'm talking about. I will ask you to speak when it is time for you to speak. I am the captain of this ship and I will not oh, have us bickering. If Bryn makes the decision of where your cannons go, we're done. Careful, Thorne. And Thorne walks away. Captain, I will, from now on, attempt to restrain myself. But when you need fury and fire called down upon our enemies, don't come to me. camera opens up on the deck of the Bois Perdue. The sun lies just 
inches above the horizon, painting the sky in violets and oranges and fiery reds as sunset threatens the sky. The crew of the Bois Perdu are stunned into silence as Thorin, with a plate full of food, storms away from the large circular wooden table that everyone is sitting, eating, and at a point conversing, having a good time. But now there's a tension in the air, so thick one could almost grab at it, so thick that it chokes everyone here in a anxious silence. Captain Hano sits in her chair at the table where Thorne has just stormed away from, hands balled into fists, her pale skin turning red at the edges as she grits her teeth over the incident that has just occurred. Avery, you're sitting at this table as well, having just witnessed all of this go down, partially because of your mentioning of the incident with the Union Navy back at Paraiso and Contrado. What are you thinking right now? I think with like all the tension that's going on and the two people that Avery has any connection with, they're in, in conflict and it's like mom and dad are fighting, like that kind of thing, <laughs> that kind of energy. I, I think Avery is just like looking for the out, feels like he said too much and wants to just, like, disappear into that conflict. Like, doesn't want to be singled out as somebody who was part of it or contributing factor. I think if, if, if the room is, you know, generally just, like, settled, but, like, anxious, tense after that, I'm going to try to excuse myself and, like, leave. Okay. In this moment before, as Avery is starting to make the decision to get up and remove himself from this uh, situation, the camera pans uh, across the table over to Felix, who kind of under his breath was taunting Thorin as he began to storm off away from this incident. Felix... Part of the reason that Thorin did blow up at Hano was because Hano was seemingly flip-flopping from being this kind of carefree captain into trying to lay down order and asking you specifically not to do what you did, not to burn down other pirate ships, not to strip them of their honor. And after Thorin kind of walked away, you, you had that moment where you told the captain if she does need fire and brimstone brought down upon her enemies, it's not to come to you. What's Felix feeling in this moment? Where is he at? Felix is coming off of freshly obtained arrogance, basically, from the, from the last mission he got what he wanted and he did it in in a spectacular way so in his mind this you know this was affirming this was this was exciting and and triumphant and then to come back to the ship and be told this is all this is all wrong he is angry but i think he's more confused i think he's more just like i don't understand why I feel like I did everything right. Why why are people mad at me for this? Is there anything specific that he's looking to do in this moment? I think he is kind of expecting like that he is going to storm away and and like someone in the crew is going to is going to be like, "Wait, Felix, no. You are you are valuable to the to the to the crew." Like <laughs> but like I, I think I think he's a little more realistic than that. I think he knows that's probably not going to happen. Maybe he's thinking it should happen. Yeah. No. Absolutely. I mean, this is a this is a show. Yeah. Basically, he is he is making a point, and he wants it to be seen. 
without any degree of subtlety to it. Yeah, absolutely. As the camera shifts away from Felix and moves over towards Bryn, you who are standing behind the captain, right over her shoulder, this argument happened because of you. The people who have spoken out seem to have taken some offense by your actions, be it the way you handled dealing with the Union Navy when you piloted the ship to take aim against them in a preemptive move to gain the advantage in the case that things went poorly. Despite your efforts and their seeming success, it has caused an issue. How's Bryn feeling? Bryn is staring at the ground, running her tongue across the sharpened meteorite tooth in her jaw. The room still loud with the same words that were spoken moments ago, bouncing around seemingly from wall to wall, replaying everything said and hearing the, the shouting and knowing that it was caused by her. Bryn's heart and stomach sink, and the silence that's in the room, but the booming echoes in her head, the ship's hull lets out a loud creak. This isn't the first time Bryn has had a crew at odds with her, but she feels like what she did was right and doesn't know or understand why it was wrong. She thinks in her head of, well, this was all I understood that would to be the right thing to do, um, and I was protecting myself. And Bryn is scared because she is worried that continuing to try and protect herself and pretend like pre- or just preserve her very being, in essence, that she will continue to hurt the people around her. Understood. Our camera lingers here for a moment, seeing these emotions flow through Bryn in whichever physical way this kind of shows, if it shows. But we stay here and linger and linger and linger. And Bryn, you feel this wave pulsate through you. Not the feelings of these emotions, but physically, as if something were bashing against your side. It is this deep, bellowing sound that no one can hear, but that you can feel. And as it like kind of pushes through you, this almost deep boom, there's this moment where you can't quite tell where it's coming from. It doesn't feel like energy or natural or like magical and in that kind of way it doesn't feel like this is something spectral this feels like something physical that's pushing against your body and there's this moment where you cannot tell if it's against you or the body of the ship and as we see this moment of recognition of oh shit, like a wave or something just hit me. Like it was like a strong like wave of water like crashed against you. Our camera then moves to Thorin, who is stomping away back to the lower decks of the ship, to his closet, to Eldorus, after having had this heated argument with the captain. Thorin, it seems like you have been spending a lot of time trying to keep things together and people are either not appreciating it or ignoring it in its entirety. Your words of wisdom, your advice, your guidance. Where's Thorin at right now? Thorin is absolutely sick and nauseated over what ultimately transpired, but kept feeling like he was pushed and pushed and pushed. He can't even look at the plate of food. He puts the veggies next to Eldoris' little nest, puts the rest of it outside the closet, and we see this stocky, 48-year-old bearded man fall over and sob into his pillow because this is not what he wanted to happen. 
and it's the culmination of trying to keep everyone protected and then trying to address it, hoping that it wouldn't happen again in the future, but nobody's getting it. And now he feels like he's the bad guy. And so he's just, he's devastated and he feels like a fuck up and like he can't protect anyone. Understood. And our camera sits here high above Thorin, looking down on him as he kind of cradles himself in, you know, his his bed sheets or blankets or, or whatever it is that he has kind of curled up. Eldorus sitting on her perch, kind of chomping at some of the bits of, of veggies left over from Johan's stir fry. And uh, there's this moment where she's just kind of like pecking at it a little bit, you know, chomping up a bits of pieces of like uh, the the green onion and, and broccoli and uh, onion and, and so on and so forth. And she kind of looks up at you, seeing you kind of curled up, kind of cocks her head a little bit, hops down from her perch, kind of glides over to the ground uh, next to you hops up uh, a little bit like next to like next to you um to where uh her beak could kind of be like near your face and we see her like kind of had kind of cock back and forth as she looks at you and she doesn't like peck you but she like kind of rubs her beak against your hand as you're lying there thorn looks to the doors so i'm sorry i'm sorry Eldor. And just pets her head. You say that. uh, And she just kind of nuzzles up to you again, moving her body closer, not quite like getting like down to your like level. And like, she's not cuddling with you, but she is there. And as you know, you kind of sit here and wallow with her. I think while you're down here, there is this sense. You're the bosun of this ship, you know? You've been on many a ships. You've been on many a cruise, on many a seas. And you get this sensation as you're quite in tune with how the ship should be sailing at specific times of day and specific uh, weather conditions and specific areas of the sea. And you feel this almost rocking of the ship. Like if a strong wave has just crashed against it it's this deep reverberating kind of force and it passes through and you get this you just get this sense as if something has passed through this ship is kind of how it feels and we cut and we go back up top uh avery i believe you said you were leaving uh time kind of plays we have left this moment what's going on With whatever quiet has kind of tensely settled over this group of people, Avery's just going to scoot his chair back slowly, uh, stand, make weak, apologetic excuses. Uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, This was a lovely conversation. I will just be back in my bunk and just like immediately evacuates out on the deck yes awesome yeah you get up uh captain hano like has no physical reaction to the words that you're saying or the fact that you're getting up uh but you do see fontaneva kind of look over towards you and silently nod in acknowledgement of uh you uh, choosing to remove yourself from this situation cool um and then i'm going to just make my way uh down to my rooms my quarters wherever they are Uh, and get out my notes and start writing all of the information that I've gleaned from my uh, interactions with Bryn. Um, While you're down there and you start regurgitating all of this information that you've just picked up from this very, very uh, chaotic day, you get this strange sensation, uh, similar to the one that you had before, right after you finished being possessed by whatever magics of the map uh, possessed you to draw in its entirety, you get that sense of 
being watched. I, I think there's this moment as like, as you're writing down, like all of, you know, as you're writing down specific uh, things about like the Driftwood Cathedral and about like the hum of certain objects and, and things of this nature, you get this very sinister, ominous feeling of like someone being right over your shoulder. So close, in fact, that you can almost feel their breath on the back of your neck. The, the, the moment that Avery feels that sort of presence is obviously going to like do the classic, like turn around quickly and like look at the space. And I'm guessing. And of course, see no one's there. Yeah, yeah, no one's there. It's, you're, you're just, it's, it's the cabin. You're just feeling... Ah, uh, stir crazy. It's fine. Uh, and I think the thing that uh, that Avery is going to just try to keep like pushing that like as like paranoia and like going stir crazy on the ship and whatever like is going to just ignore that and try to push it to the back burner basically. Yeah. And just focus fully on um, all the stuff he's learned and i think the way that um the way i want to establish that avery kind of does this because he doesn't have any sort of actual sounding board mm -hmm. is that he pretends as though he is having a conversation with alice and is mm -hmm. sounding these things off of her because she's always been good for like that sort of thing and so he starts mm -hmm. talking to alice going through the information, trying to organize it, trying to make sense of it, talking to himself. Absolutely. As you turn back around from like being like, okay, gotta, who gotta, there's no one there, gotta focus. You turn back to your notes and the writing in your notes is not the same as when you turned around originally, when you felt that presence there. On the page in front of you, instead of, you know, all of the notes about what Bryn has said and, and all of this other information, there is a singular verse of a nursery rhyme written in red ink on the page in front of you. Um, and almost as if you're reading it, you hear the sound of the song that you know this from. It's the same nursery rhyme that the original myth of, of Jacques and the Box is from. Uh, and you look on the page and it just says, All around the merchant ship, Jacques would watch the weasel. The weasel thought it was all in fun. Pop will go the weasel. And it's just written in red on the page where your notes were. Like my notes are gone too. Like, just this page. Grab that page immediately and like holding it up to the light and stuff like that. Like looking at this writing. Does it look fresh? Like, is is the ink still, you know, I'm holding it up to the, I'm holding it up to the light. I'm just I'm like looking at like, is it still shining? Like, is it like, is it fresh? It's wet. Ink? Yeah, it's fresh. Yeah. It's wet and red and red. Yeah. Avery is just convinced that he's going a little crazy and like is going to look all around for the the notes that he knows he just wrote. I just wrote I, I, I just wrote those down upon finding this strange sheet of paper that doesn't look like the notes that he just wrote down. I'm obviously going to start sorting back through the loose pieces of paper that I've been, you know, writing my notes on, looking for the notes that I I'm sure that I just wrote. I know I was just writing this and where is it and what, what happened with it? So like just in investigating whatever this piece of paper is and where my notes went. For sure. You start, going back through uh, all of your pages, uh, frantically being like, trying to be like, okay, hey, I know I wrote these. I don't have to think what, what's going on. And, you know, you're, you're going through all of them and you can't find the notes that you just wrote until eventually you go back to the page, the original page. And all of your notes are there. The red writing is gone. And you have found them. Cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, if I if I go back to that sheet of paper, I'm relieved that my notes are still there and definitely still um, like puts puts the notes back down, closes up that like binder of notes or whatever. And is like, I obviously need some 
air. Something is, uh, something, something is not right. I just, uh, going a little stir crazy. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll visit the doctor. That might be, that might be the way to go. Or maybe, maybe I just, uh, need rest. What time of day is it? Uh, it's sunset right now. It's sunset. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Avery just like goes up to the deck for some air, but is like, I just need to call it a night. As Avery is spending time in this room back on top deck, uh, what's, uh, what's up? The food people are starting to get back into like tensely talking with each other, awkwardly trying to dance around the conversation that has already taken place here. Hano stews in her seat with Fontaneva anxiously bobbing a knee, eating her dinner like right next to her. Felix, Bren, what's going on? I think that Bren is still very much outside of herself in a sense where she's in the room, but like her attention and her mind is elsewhere. Um, I don't think that Bren is really thinking about much else than the sensation that she felt and the words and the fighting still clouding her space, just repeating everything that she heard and ruminating on them. Felix? I don't think Felix does a lot of, like, casual smoking. I think mm-hmm. it is usually, like, purposeful because it's for, you know, his, his magic or to seem cool. But I think right now, I think he's just smoking. I think he is stressed and he is, uh, I mean, yeah, he's still feeling this confusion and anger and is just sort of trying to push it away. Mm-hmm. I think after a moment and after feeling the sensation and kind of like having to try and get herself out of a spiral, Bryn feels that sensation and and, and takes a moment to put a hand on Captain Hano's shoulder um, and goes, Captain Hano, I think I'm feeling ill or something of the like. Would you mind um, escorting me back to my chambers? She's kind of sitting in her chair and you can almost feel as much as you can feel her kind of tense up a little bit at your touch and is kind of shaken by what you said uh, out of her kind of inner monologue that she was going through and kind of reacts to what you're saying with a sick. Can you? And she looks up to you to try to get, like, some kind of recognition of, like, what is this? Because I guess in her mind, you can't get sick. You're dead, right? Um, She looks to you to try to see, like, what is the intent here? What does she see? I think that Bryn's eyes are dull. I think that um, when Hano looks up at Bryn, Bryn, like, normally that are glowing, Bryn's eyes are almost, like are nearing hues of gray. I think Hano sees that and immediately she can tell that something is wrong here Um, and gets uh, and like kind of slowly gets out of her chair and says, all right, yeah, I'll, um, yeah, we can get you to your quarters. Um, Excuse us, Fontaneva. um, Fontaneva's, Felix Fontaneva, you're more than welcome. I just, um, sorry. Sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, no, oh, I'm you're, sorry. No, you're fine. Um, you're and fine. Bren starts kind of uh, walking um, away. Uh, so then to that, Hano will get up and kind of look over to uh, Fontaneva and you, Felix, to see, like, if you all want to come, you most certainly can. Uh, you notice that Fontaneva just kind of shakes her head no silently and says, I'll, I'll leave you all to do what you do uh and will just like eyes in food eating what about you felix felix i think is uh ignoring hano right now so uh yeah just ignores okay i think that a moment goes on and like as brin's kind of walking away notices that no one else is coming i think brin looks back and like looks at Felix and just like tries desperately to make eye contact. I think this I think this works. Felix is not ignoring Bryn. 
he like kind of makes a motion as if to say like what do you want from me i think bren lurches like her shoulders and head and kind of nods it in a way as in like come on felix shrugs and uh yeah joins along okay the three of you take your leave of the deck where everyone is eating and head down. Bryn, where are your quarters? And what are they like? I think that we've seen parts of them. I think that this ship has two crow's nests. And the one that Bryn took uh, Avery to was a smaller one. And the largest one is Bryn's. Bryn doesn't sleep. Bryn doesn't have many belongings this is the one place that Bryn has been able to make her own and that's it it's just the crow's nest so the three of you climb the rigging up to the highest crow's nest to Bryn's quarters I think there's like an assortment of like straw filled pillows and or like a rummaged blanket or two that like line the inside of it. There is a few small, almost shelves that have been carved out of the inner inner wall of the crow's nest, so small things can be set on it. There's various writings in Belenutian. Over the crow's nest, there's also a large piece of dark linen, as if to create like a shroud or a tent. As they go in, Bryn takes that down to reveal the night sky. Yeah, as you all get up there, I think marching order of this was probably Bryn, Hano, then Felix. Or I guess the rigging probably comes up uh, from multiple vectors, so uh, Hano and Felix can kind of reach up here around the same time as you are given access to the space. Um, Felix, how do you choose to and habit this do you get up there sit in there do you just like hang along the side like how does how does felix i think felix is hanging around the side for sure and i think as he like sort of settles into a to a place and when uh bryn removes the uh the the sort of covering to reveal the to reveal the night sky he just like i think i think he like because I, I, I don't know, I've been picturing this in, in relative silence, this, mm-hmm. uh, this walk. And he sort of breaks the silence with a, like, half-sarcastic... He just, he just goes, lovely night. All of them are lovely, if you look hard enough. I'm sure. Uh, Hano uh, climbs up the side, and if you will allow her, will kind of nestle, like, sit in the, uh, the bucket of the crow's nest... Uh, on the opposite side of where uh, Felix is kind of hanging off uh, the side still, <laughs> like still like kind of feet on the rigging, arms like over the side of it. And she just kind of sits back and lets out this deep sigh and just kind of stares off into the distance. I think as Bryn stares into the night sky, there's like a small flicker in her eyes. I don't know if anyone notices that, but with a moment, Bryn turns to Felix and Hano. I apologize for my behavior, and I didn't think my actions would be so... I didn't think my actions would be met with such hostility. Hano, I'm sorry, and Felix, likewise. I truly don't... I don't know. I fear I'll put you all in danger. Another deep sigh from Captain Hano. When you haven't... Look, not everybody understands what you do for this ship. Or even what this ship is. What you are. I understand. I understand why you did what you did. But you must also understand that, unlike some of your older crews, I can't speak for all of them honestly i i don't really know you know what they were how they worked only you and them would know but there is a mutual agreement amongst us pirates the ships that we sail on and the crews that we sail with mutually benefit everyone that every action 
taken by the crew is for the crew. That every person we steal from or kill, and she will look to you, Felix, (laughs) is not just an individual action. It is representative of us, and the way we choose to represent ourselves matters because we don't do this for ourselves. I mean, we kind of do. <laughs> we, we, we do it for ourselves, but in a broader sense that it, it's hard to explain. I guess I will leave it at this. When I am not around and Fontaneva is in charge, listen to Fontaneva. She's wise. She's been doing this a long time. She just wants what's best for the crew. And so does Thorin, honestly. My only question, I suppose, is what if what's best for the crew isn't what's best for the ship? You see her, like, take this deep inhale and, like, does the thing where her eyes wander as she's like, I don't even... God, oh, fuck, I don't know. <laughs> I think Felix says... No, you lost me there. Uh, oh, Felix. Uh, Felix, if something happens to the ship, then... If you let me, Captain Hono, I would like to share something with the two of you. I know maybe the three of you, but that's up to Felix, not me. Um, if you'd have a moment with me, I'd appreciate it. And bring kind of looks to both of them. If I go up on the deck for air, like, how... Yeah, you might be able to see... At least Felix's legs <laughs> dangling <laughs> off the side of the top. You, you uh, probably see like a light glow emanating inside of the like crow's nest from Bryn's tattoos. So yeah, uh, Avery, uh, as you come out and it's getting to around the point where people are starting to pack up dinner and be like, all right, maybe we should, <laughs> maybe we should get out of here. You know, the vibe kind of. Vibe kind of sucks here. <laughs> yeah. Bad vibes. That vibes are rancid. Uh, we're going to pack up and, you know, maybe uh, Try let's again go play in the some morning. dice somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Everybody yeah. just starts, you know, packing up, you know, trying to, starting to get into the end of day routine here. Uh, and, uh, yeah, as you look up, you see the faint glow of Bryn's tattoos and the upper crow's nest, as well as the dangling legs of uh felix cormier okay yeah i'll I'll just like out of pure curiosity because everyone else seems to be like going about their business and i'm just interested in why everybody's up in the crow's nest yeah i'll just start uh walking over towards that part of the ship and like looking up understood i don't know if i can hear anything that's going to be said but uh because from down there probably not no yeah, yeah. figured. awesome i think a camera is following Avery as he he comes out uh, onto the uh, top deck of the ship, kind of looking around, seeing as people are starting to get back into their regular routine and kind of pans upward uh, to see the uh, upper crow's nest. And I think as we kind of like look at Avery, like kind of recognizing, oh, they're up there and him kind of pondering on what to do next. We cut back to Thorin. Thorin. You're in the closet. You're you're here with Eldora. So you kind of felt that weird wave earlier. What's up? What's what's on Thorne's mind? It is, is he staying here, going somewhere? What's up? The wave sensation. You said that was something that felt odd. Like yeah. Thorne would know that that that's. Yeah, it didn't feel the same as like just a strong wave hitting the ship it felt like a strong wave but like as if something hit the ship and then moved through it almost like it was almost like a sound wave not that thorn would be able to conceptualize what that is but for us it was almost like a a wave of sound rippled through this ship thorn despite how this evening has gone is still the mantilla he still has responsibility to the ship and to the crew, regardless of what they think of him. Uh, if he feels something off, um, he sits up, kind of rubs, you know, any residual tears out of his eyes or anything like that, and just feels it while it happens. Starts to think, wave, and then feels that kind of ricochet. And he's, Ildor, heighten sight, then rebound. 
and we see Eldorus. She has a little tunnel. So we see Eldorus fly high above the ship, really high. And she is looking straight top down at the ship. She's looking at the ship, and she's also looking around the ship. Oh, and also during this time, Thorin is going up to meet her uh, on top deck. What does Eldorus see, if anything? Uh, Eldorus shoots out of the window, climbing into the air, high above uh, even the crow's nest uh, of the ship, and gets a bird's eye view of uh, a couple of miles around of uh, what is otherwise really calm ocean. She sees far off uh, in the distance, like the silhouette of a silhouette of Paraiso Encontrado far off in the distance and and in the other direction, like the silhouette of the silhouette of the coastline of mainland Espinora. But other than water and your ship, she sees nothing. Not above the water. Does the water move in a weird way? Is there anything... I don't think there's anything that Eldora sees. And uh, Bryn, Felix, and probably also Avery, the three of you see as Eldorus, like, shoots out from, like, the side of the ship up into the air, uh, past even where the two of you are in the highest crow's nest, and see Eldorus kind of take this sweeping scan of the area around the ship. And then I think eventually, uh, Avery, you would be the first uh, to see as Thorn comes running up the stairs uh, to the top deck. Great, yeah. <laughs> Run into Thorn. <laughs> well, I'll see Thorn running. Ah, Avery. Um, is, is everything all right? Did you feel anything strange? Uh, just a little while ago, there was a... We hit something, uh, or the absence of something. Something happened. I don't believe I know what you're talking about, but I have been a bit preoccupied, so I could have missed whatever it was. I, is there an emergency, or...? Uh, not necessarily. As you say that, you feel it again. And this time it comes in twos, where it's vroom, vroom, and it, like, ripples through the ship. Up top, uh, Bryn, you feel these double waves of, again, it's almost like as if a strong burst of sound, you know. Have you ever been, I mean, okay, Marcy, I know you have been to concerts. Um, have you ever been so close to the speaker at a concert that, like, someone just hits a real hard lick and it just fucking shoots through you like a wave, <laughs> like as if you're in the ocean and a like a wave of water, like not just crashes into you, but moves every molecule of your body in a way that only sound can. Yeah, I've been there. I know that feeling. That is what is happening to Bryn right now. But there is no sound to be heard. And again, you cannot differentiate that feeling of it happening to you, your physical form, and happening to you, the ship. I think Bryn's eyes grow less saturated again. And she begins to tremble. And Bryn kind of hastily fumbles through a few things in her crow's nest and hands a few small artifacts, one being a large thumb ring to Felix, and the other being a ornate dagger to Hano. Uh, the dagger itself is, the blade is a purplish blue that kind of twinkles along with the gemstone um, in the ring. And Bryn looks at them both and says, if you, if you two wouldn't mind, would you please join me for a moment? And Bryn, I'm going to try, and I think we discussed that with Prophesize, Bryn didn't necessarily have to sleep, but could instead commune with the stars. I would like to use my Prophesize move, and I will take my Starstruck uh, weakness. I am wondering if in order to allow Hano and... 
Felix a sort of glimpse into this world and a glimpse into the connection of the Celestials, could I roll Twist Fate? This is kind of what I was thinking. Felix, do you have bond with Bryn? Yes. Okay, cool. For this, you can spend rank with Bryn to give her plus... You can assist in this prophesied role by adding plus one. And the way that you're kind of doing this is through accepting this token from her and like kind of allowing yourself to act as uh, like a partial conduit to yeah. uh, to this. Absolutely, I'm doing that. Awesome. Hano uh, does as well, does not give a mechanical benefit uh, such as uh, Felix, uh, but she is here with you and will experience the same thing. Can I also spend a rank with the ship to increase it as well? I will allow you to spend luck from that. Okay, I will, I will, I'll spend one luck then. Okay, awesome. And we can and flavor this as you channeling some of your energy uh, through the ship to be able to, you know, give yourself. So it's a plus two to this roll? Plus my Spitfire, so it's a plus four. Awesome. Whew. That is an 11. Awesome. On a 10 plus, at any time within the next few days, you can pull luck strings and prophesy something strange or fortunate to occur. Describe what happens in your prophecy. It will happen. Logic and fates permitting. And that, that prophecy is explained during the event when I cast it, correct? You can either say what happens right now or you can just save this. You can, this happens within the next few days. Like you have any time yeah. between now and the next few days to say the thing that I prophesize happens and then tell us what that vision is. If you want it to happen immediately or if you just want to say what it is right now and we just make it come true later, all of that is within the bounds of this. I'm going to have a fun little moment. Okay, go for it. Can I make it as I'm prophesizing this? Can I have it start speeding up so that Felix and Hano can both feel it while something else is going on? You open yourself up to the celestial beings and the stars and all that they entail, the infinite possibility, the unbridled potentiality of the universe constantly in motion constantly cycling amongst itself as you make yourself sensitive to this opening yourself up becoming more vulnerable to these sensations to be able to look into all of these different branching pathways of potential and cause and effect the physical sensations of the world around you also become more sensitive and felix you and Hano open yourselves up in a similar way, becoming more vulnerable to the world around you, feeling in a way the hum. We've heard it described by Bryn before, this kind of constant hum that kind of surrounds everything to do with these stardust and chunks of meteorite. You feel the token that she has given you, this ornate thumb ring pulsate in a very dull way in almost as if something is kind of lightly tapping against you, almost thumping you in the place where this ring is. And as you're opening yourself up, as the three of you open yourselves up to the influence of the world around you, you feel the same <sighs> the same sound wave move through you. And it's strange because it doesn't feel like you necessarily. You feel it in your body, but the way in which it hits you, it feels like you are larger. It's hitting you in places that you didn't know you had or the thing that you don't have. It's hitting you like water against wood. And I don't know how to describe that in a way that makes sense for the human body, but that is the way Felix is experiencing these waves. And it happens once and then again and again. And as you're becoming more sensitive, you realize, I think Bryn, you realize, but also Felix and Hano realize, while Bryn may have only felt it sometimes, 
It is constantly happening in a string of waves back to back to back. And I think, Felix, you recognize something out of this, out of the rhythm of these waves. This is not just random. It's music. And I think as you are feeling it and recognize that, you recognize that not all of these waves that are hitting you are the same tone. It's playing a song, deep, bellowing, chasing. And we cut back down to Avery and Thorin. You've just felt these double waves come hit. Avery, you haven't felt it. You don't have your sea legs quite yet. You haven't had the same experience that Thorin has had. Thorin, you feel this. And while the actual ship itself doesn't really shake or rock all of that much, you can feel these waves, almost as if they're trying to knock you off balance, despite the fact that the deck is steady. Are they? So they're still up in the crow's nest doing their seance? Yeah, you probably almost like you, I mean, of course you don't know they're doing their seance, but you could probably like the light from Bryn's tattoos are probably glowing a little brighter, maybe even like kind of fading and glowing out and fading and glowing out. Uh, At this point, Thorn has felt this several times. I think after the interaction with Avery, uh, I said, sorry, Avery, I need to go to top deck. Should I come with? I, I You absolutely can, and Thorne's booking it. Um, Gets to top deck, looks around, still seeing people, I imagine. Yeah, people are out here. Uh, You were already on top deck by the time you ran into Avery. That's where Avery was. But on top deck, you see that people don't seem phased by this because they don't feel it. They are going about their nightly routine, or starting to. I think Thorne notices that, starts because, starts to doubt himself because has run into Avery, everyone that he's talked to so far has been like, the fuck is wrong with you? And then sees uh, our lovely trio uh, topside and then sees Eldorus still hovering, I imagine. Before Thorne does anything, Eldorus is curious. She hasn't seen anything, but she's a bird. She's felt these things. She can feel them. So what I do think Eldora sees is Bryn looking ill, Felix being Felix, and Hanno with a dagger? Yeah? What Eldora sees is Bryn is hovering above the crow's nest in the similar way of when she was commanding the sails. Her hair going much more into a celestial field, her body, like her fingers and hands somewhat doing the same her eyes glowing brightly like lamps, and the tattoos also pulsating. Um, there's small trails of that, that, that fuchsia and, 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 and kind of pinkish, and the teal kind of winding through the air and connecting to the, the meteorite fragments that both Hano and Felix have. What Felix and Hano see, Bryn almost fades into the night sky and blends in with it into the field of star it's, itself. Um, the only thing separating her form from the night sky itself are those glowing channels of light that wind through her body and her eyes. And Felix is standing there. Yeah. <laughs> and Hano. Hano is staring in awe. Uh, not just... You know, partially because of the visual aspect of, like, seeing Bryn do this. But also, again, both Hano and Felix are physically feeling these waves of music pulsate through them in ways that nothing has ever felt before. Eldorus, dissatisfied with the fact that she could not see anything from top, sees Thorn, but doesn't like that she has nothing to return to him with. And so she perches herself on the crow's nest, I think thinks Bryn is busy, and so looks at Hano, even though Hano is experiencing these things. Strange sense. Strange. I don't know if Hano is in a state to respond. 
I think for the first time, Hano, and I, can't, I of course can't speak for Felix, but I think Hano is experiencing overstimulation where because she is both feeling this music ripple through her, but also everything feels more. Everything is, she's being blinded and deafened and the physical touch versions of those as well. I think Eldora sees as Hano grips tightly onto the side of the basket of the crow's nest with her one hand and just like kind of staring, trying to mutter words and respond, looks over to Eldorus, but is so paralyzed by this sensation that she can do nothing but kind of mutter and garble in, in garbled vocal nothingness. Flustered, but having gotten some information, Eldorus throws herself down back at Thorn and says, He sings same, friends, strange sense. So if the sea is singing the same, then the sea is normal. She went up and saw nothing. Friends have a strange sense. So Thorn is in this very uncomfortable position where he knows something is up. Eldorus knows something is up. It's going on with the three people that he really <laughs> feels, and they're like doing something right now. <laughs> so he feels, it feels bad. It feels mm -hmm. really bad. And he's like, I think he starts to climb up. If I feelings. can just interject real quick. I think Please. this is the first time Avery has heard Eldora speak. Certainly, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. So, oh, my God. <laughs> I think whatever Eldora says, I think, like, if, if Thorin says anything else, like, uh, Avery's just going to be a little bit like, she she talks. I She talks. Yeah, she's raven. Walks off. She talks. What? If, if that's the case, I, I think uh, while Thorin climbs up, Eldorus will just hang here Thorin. with you. you okay. <laughs> I'm just making sure that we mark the fact that uh, this raven is now, like, making sense. So the two of you climbed your way all the way up uh, to the highest crow's nest uh, to where... Uh, the three of them are. Does not get on the crow's nest, to be clear. Like... Thorn very slowly, very sheepishly went up this crow's nest and realized that uh, Avery was in fact following, which is fine, but he's just, I'm trapped. Uh, <laughs> again. <laughs> there are multiple uh, vectors again. Avery doesn't have to be right behind you, can't be on the other side climbing up. Would he be though? I don't know, no. Avery. <laughs> I would no. be okay, following yeah, him. That's, that's yeah. what I felt I'm not, in my heart. I'm not good with boats. Like, I'm going to follow the exact path. I'm going to be like, oh, okay. So I go there and that's then what I there. Thought. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So basically what I'm imagining is, I imagine there's a little dip in the wood where you're like trying to get over. And so not getting in, he just kind of gets to the side to try, because it's netting, right? So I imagine Avery can kind of come over. And you kind of just see what I imagine is maybe two pairs of hands, mine and Avery's, and then tops of head and eyeballs looking over the top and sees this display. What in and the goddess's like, name? What in the what in the whole goddamn shit? <laughs> 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 and Eldorus is on Thorin's like, strange sense, friends. Yeah, you see Hano is uh, sitting here, like, sees you, and you can tell, like, she... I don't know what experience that uh, that Thorin has with, like, overstimulation, or uh, if he is, like, seen, if he either has himself experienced it or has been around people who has experienced it, but if so, that is very much what is happening to Hano. How is Felix feeling in this moment with all of this sensory information as well as whatever the uh whatever whatever vision you're about to get from uh from Bryn. i kind of feel like the sensation the way i would describe how felix is feeling right now is intoxicated 
he is like feeling this and you like how how you described it as uh as 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 like music and he is feeling it and his i think his eyes are like half closed and he when thorin and avery like come into view he like says to them oh friends can you feel this can you feel this uh and i think he sort of starts like humming trying to like hum, like trying to hum along but it doesn't really work like it doesn't okay. re- it's not exactly what it is but it is like it is complementary to it in some way okay yes felix making jazz with these ocean beats felix you begin humming the sound of this song, almost like a counter melody of this song uh, that you are feeling physically and hearing in a way. Avery, you recognize this song. You've heard this song many times or a version of it in church. Uh, in one of the many, many days of service that you and your family had gone to the Grand Cathedral of New Haven, of the Church of the First Song, sat amongst its pews, listened to the sermons of the high principal who was evangelizing that day, and the many songs, of course, one sings in the Church of the First Song. This is one of those songs. So... Having recognized Felix humming some like counter melody to a song that like, do I get any sense of where that's coming from? Why he's like, because I can see something's happening here, but like, yeah, yeah, you can see something's happening here. And Felix just starts humming this song that you haven't heard. And I mean, is Avery a devout practicer how often does he attend service nowadays nowadays doesn't even before like 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 right before you know in the time before his 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 stay on the ship yeah i think i think avery was in that stage where he's going to like keep up appearances like very very infrequently but enough that like nothing comes of it where it's like that you know one of the Morrigans is not attending the cathedral. Like, yeah, so he's he's keeping up appearances, and I think he just had a very big shift as to why he was even going, where, like, he's now, he's he's not receiving it and internalizing it. It is, it's information to be used and to be processed instead of just accepted, so... I've been there, Avery. I yeah, get it. exactly. Cool. Yeah, no, no, no. I've been, yeah, no, no, no. Avery, I get it. I get it. One hundred percent. For anyone who doesn't know, Avery's deconstructing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Avery's during, in his deconstruction period. Yeah, Absolutely. Exactly. <laughs> no, let's put that. That's, yeah, Avery's deconstructing. So yes, like that's where. So yeah, would obvi- would very much recognize this, especially with like family that is played in the Dirge Eterna and like all of that. Yeah. 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 But uh, yeah, has d- still doesn't have any context for why this is happening. So I guess I'm just going to like look at I'm just going to watch Felix because Felix is the only touch point I have really now of like any context for what's going on. Maybe hum the actual melody <laughs> to go with the counter melody. Do you do you do that? I will. Yeah. 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 I think Felix is like half closed eyes like open all the way and he like I think he makes eye contact with Avery and is and like like kind of blank expression but just like acknowledging that this is that this is happening they're singing the same song Thorin uh you these two just start humming music at you uh, (laughs) or around you uh you have no idea why Thorin obviously was still very sheepish about like interrupting inter intruding these you know with these three you but you said that hano looked overstimulated like she was struggling and you asked if you know what what is thorin's 
experience with this? Does he have any experience or anything like that with this? I will say that Thorin has had a small child, and so knows what overstimulation looks like and the kind of fear that it can strike in someone. So, that's all that it takes seeing her in that distress. It's all that it takes to quite literally get him over the edge. Um, I think he kind of slowly, gently walks up to Hanu. Hanu, Hanu, it's all right, love. I'm here if you need a hand. <laughs> As this is happening, um, Felix and Hano, you look into the night sky and the ocean starts swirling with a bright white and rich blue, almost as if it's glowing and it's swirling like this pool, like a marble. And you look into the sky and the stars seem to be glowing a brighter yellow. And one by one, they start falling out of the sky. Not into the ground, but just disappearing as though they were just going behind the horizon until the sky is blank. And all you see is the darkness of space. And almost with a snap, all of the stars are back, forming thousands of eyes across the night sky. Each of their pupils glowing either that teal or that fuchsia that Bryn has along her arms and you hear a boom in your ears. Children of the stars, you call to us, and so we answer. But that answer is already among you, and all you must do is listen. And I think Bryn, and I think Felix and Hano start to hear whispers and words of those they've known throughout their lives, telling them stories or commenting about things that they've done recently and speaking to them. And after a few moments, um, the constellations form what looks like a large, vaguely humanoid body, but things seem warped and twisted. And the humanoid body pulls out a bow and arrow and it knocks an arrow, pulling the string back and letting it fly. And within a moment, a flash, a flicker, an arrow with the same stone for a head finds itself lodged in the crow's nest. And the sky flickers and the ocean flickers and it returns back. As the arrow hits the crow's nest, both Felix and Hano feel the arrow as if it had hit them in their own chests. But in, in the same sense where you can, you can delineate your bodies and the, ship, it's phys, the ship's physicality itself, and you can almost relate these two points to one another. As that arrow hits the crow's nest, you hear that hum again ring out, almost like a shockwave, and the voices subside. I think Thorin sees a flash from the skies and an arrow thunk into the into the crow's nest, and I think I, I think I think as it hits, I think both Avery and Thorin feel the hum in their bodies. As the thunk hits the uh, hits the crow's nest, uh, Avery and Thorin, the two of you feel it's not the same reverberation that you felt earlier thorn this is a different kind of wave and it and it washes over you not in the same kind of unsteady way that the other one did this is more like a warmth like a wave of warmth washing over you past you through you and gone and would I have that feeling before or after the big fucking meteorite arrow just <laughs> shot? It's, and... it's like as it hits it, as that's it hits... what it feels like. Okay, that's what it feels like. I'm comforting Hano. I would say that the way the meteorite moves through the sky and the air, it almost looks like a shooting star. Still hits the crow's nest with, I imagine, some intensity though, right? I mean, oh, yeah. N- as much as a normal arrow, I'd imagine. Yeah. Regardless of any warm feelings, Thorin starts to feel 
Oh no, it's all. Oh, right, love. Thump. Fuck! What the fuck? <laughs> it just. <laughs> yeah, Avery stops humming abruptly with the. Yeah, I can imagine, like, for, like I can see why Hano and uh, Felix wouldn't, you know, they're being, yeah. them being too entranced, but Thorin, first thing Thorin does is like, it's like, what? What was that? Is everyone okay? There was a flash of light. Is there a fire? So he says, Avery. Yes? Thorin crawls, like, does an army crawl. He doesn't know what the fuck just hit the crow's nest, but knows that you're not safe on the nest and you're closer, or, you know, not safe on the net and wants to pull you into the nest. And so throws an arm over and says, come on, lad, come here. Uh, yeah, I, I climb right in. <laughs> I climb in. And then as Avery is climbing in, um, see, kind of hearing the commotion, Bryn's a bit more salient. He's hovering and turns around. Thorin, Avery, I promise. It's, it's quite all right. Hanno and Felix are a bit preoccupied, and there's no danger, really. It's a gift from the heavens. Um, and I think Bryn leans over and pulls the arrow out of the crow's nest and kind of presents it to both Thorin and Avery. I, like, make eye contact with Bryn, but I, I want to, like, reach out and touch it, because this arrow just materialized as far as I can tell. Yeah, absolutely. When you make eye contact with Bryn, you see a, a quick flash of the same vision you saw before. Not, like, not so super long, but just, like, almost as if, like, almost as if you your eyes passed over a television and you caught a glimpse of a show that was on. Uh, and Bryn... Um, hands the arrow down to you. It's still warm to the touch. Where did it come from? Did you summon it? Oh, Avery, no, 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 no. Um, I, I, it's quite a compliment, actually, to insinuate I could summon something like that. No, it's a gift, like I said, from those beyond. Felix, as Bryn is holding out this arrow, there's a sense within you, a feeling it's not quite your own it's kind of there in the back of your mind seeping in like smoke through cracks underneath a door a deep desire you want this arrow not just you damien wants this arrow but you you are compelled to feel the same do you allow yourself to feel this feeling or do you try to stand your ground I think I think he allows himself to feel it. There is a strong sense in you. This is something special, a gift by some entity, no matter. But what this is, or what it really is, is power. And you feel that. You don't know why or what kind of power or what it's tied to or what it can do. But you know that it's powerful and you know that you want it more than anything. So I think when this feeling washes over him, Felix kind of doesn't stop humming. But he is talking and like in the like breaks in his in his speech he is resuming the the humming and he just goes let me see it i'd like to maybe use my investigate move on this situation yeah are you investigating the situation or are you trying to take stock of felix or like size him up the uh, latter yeah size up okay cool when you size someone up roll plus vinegar oh fuck yeah that's a 13 Oh, shit. Okay, yeah. Uh, on a hit, you hold two. Uh, so you can spend hold one for one to ask any of the following questions. What sorts of treasure are you carrying? How are you actually feeling? What's your goal here? What aces do you have up your sleeve? How could I get you to blank? Spend hold at any point in time, uh, but you have two of them, which means you can ask two of these questions. Yeah, I think I... Think I see this weirdness uh, in Felix's demeanor and how fixated he suddenly becomes on the stair. And the arrow is obviously strange. Like, I immediately was like, what is that? Can I look? But, like, there's something that I see in Felix and I just, I, I make eye contact with him again. I say, what's your goal here? Why do you need this arrow? 
You must answer truthfully. I think straight up his goal is get the arrow. Get it. I think that is that much is just like is pretty cut and dry. And I think what conveys this is just the like a sort of like starkness in his voice that is just like no nonsense, just like, you know, because Felix, I think, is prone to embellishing his sentences Mm -hmm. quite a bit. And this is not one of those times. It is straight to the point. Um, I will hand the arrow back to Bryn and be like, well, you'll have to ask Bryn about that. Bryn kind of scooches between, is sure to be between Felix and Bryn and Avery. Yeah. Yeah, I'll hand I'll hand the arrow back to Bryn. Be like, you'd have to ask Bryn about that. How are are you feeling all right? And that's my other question. I'm going to, how are you actually feeling? I'm gonna, are you feeling all right, Felix? Felix is feeling, I think still this kind of like, this kind of intoxication, you know, he's sort of lost himself to the sensations that are going on. You, you can tell he's not like super in control not in like a possession sense, but in like a, I guess, impulse kind of kind of thing. Like he's he's not like he's not thinking through his words or actions right now. And I think he can just tell this because of I've uh, like just his his the I mean, the I think the humming is still like uh, a good a good clue to that. Of just just like that, and that he is still doing it, and I think when when you give the arrow back to 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 Bryn, I think his his head kind of like jerks a little bit towards towards Bryn then, and he just goes, "Give me the arrow, Bryn. I want to see it." Bryn's eyes widen for a moment, and then they kind of soften, and a smile goes across Bryn's face. Like a very soft smile. What is Bryn thinking in this moment? Bryn is thinking that in this moment, Felix has seen the beauty of the Celestials and is enamored, wants to know more, wants to feel more, wants to see more. I think Felix kind of smiles in return. Less of like a of a like I'm happy about this smile, but almost more of a like you have sent me a signal and I am returning it in some way. Like <laughs> it is like so spooky. It, 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 is, it is it is it is it is like yeah, it is it is just like again this almost just acknowledgement of this interaction. Before anything happens next, the two of you smile at each other. Whether or not Bryn was going to give the arrow to Felix, or if someone were to stop this from happening, you all in this moment feel a big push, another wave, larger, than before and this time all of you feel it and you feel it again and again in the same rhythm as before what was once music so distant is now close what was just ripples in a pond are now waves and it has direction now it is not just from everywhere it is from back where you came in the direction of Paraiso and Contrado And you can feel, no, not just feel, you can hear the music now as if it were buried in leagues of ocean, but is rising and coming closer 
and closer. And as you all turn in the direction of like, kind of being like, what the hell? Looking off into the direction where the source of this is coming from, I think Thorin, you are the first to see, partially because Eldorus reacts so harshly to this, ripples in the water, something moving, something large, moving fast, moving towards you, and you see it break the surface. As the music at its full height and sound, no longer buried underneath water, clear as day to all of you. And sure enough, Avery, it is the exact music that you heard all those years ago, so many times within the Church of the First Song, because it is a song from the Church of the First Song. And you see rising from the waters a ship, its masthead is the first peak, rising almost like a submarine for us, but there's no context. Like a shark from water, rising, breaking the surface, high into the air, slamming down, breaking the water, and you see a ship, massive, its flags that of the Union Navy, and at the head of the ship is a man with short blonde hair, glasses, a violin in his hand, still going, playing the music you all heard, loud as if from speakers in an auditorium booming as you hear the music reaching a fever pitch, him strumming, smile ripping across his face, teeth gleaming in the now rising moonlight. The Union Navy is here. Uh, wow, what a what a session. Great job, everybody. <laughs> what a session. So good. Wow. You all did amazing. Wow, guys. Cool boy. That's really neat and fun and cool, too. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. So, end of session. Um, Thorin, did you defeat a major foe? No. Did you gain significant treasure? No. Did you accomplish one of your character's goals during this session? Eldorus found her voice. Yippee! Amazing. Uh, you get to pick one of uh, those three things. You can mark one experience, you can add one ranked uh, with someone else, uh, or you can clear all of your weaknesses. Mark one experience always. Okay, dope. Felix. Yeah. Did you defeat a major foe? Nope. Gain significant treasure? Nope. Accomplish one of your character's goals? I don't think so. You had interactions with both Bryn and Avery. That's true. That is true. And you also gain further understanding of the world. You did vibe. That is true. Yeah. That you did is vibe. True. You put vibe. No, yeah. You, you know, vibed yeah, hard. Hell. Yeah, no. I did accomplish those. Some. Amazing. Of. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Some of. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Then you can mark one experience, add one rank with someone else, or clear all of your weaknesses. Um, I didn't actually realize this. I have the uh, bedeviled weakness right now. Yeah, no, that's what I was acting on when you did gotcha. that. Gotcha. Yeah, no, so I couldn't not, I couldn't have even resisted it. Yeah, unless you stood your ground. But I don't know if you had any rank with anyone who would have been revel relevant to actually be able yeah. to help you out of that. I think I'm going to clear that. I'm, I'm going to clear. You're going to clear? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Mercy or <clears throat> Bryn, uh, did you f defeat a major foe? Uh-uh. Gain significant treasure? Uh-huh. Uh, accomplish one of your character's goals. Uh-huh. Tell me, which one of your goals did you do? I would say the goal I did was commune with a celestial or another crewmate. Also, I obtained a meteorite piece. That is true. Um, also, I had a crewmate understand slash commune with the celestials. True. Bryn over here just doing all of her stuff. I'm fucking, yeah. I'm goal-oriented. I'm girl boss. <laughs> girl, Bryn's girl a girl boss. boss. Amazing. Okay, cool. Uh, awesome. So uh, gain one XP, uh, add one rank with someone, or clear all of your weaknesses. I gain one XP? In one of those three. I'm going to keep Starstruck. I'm going to take an experience. Okay, awesome. All right, Avery, 
Did you defeat a major foe? No. Gain significant treasure? No. Accomplish one of your character's goals? Yes. Had an interaction with, with Felix. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Mark one experience, add one uh, to your rank with someone, or clear all of your weaknesses. Uh, I will take an experience. Okay, sounds good. I will say, gang, like I said, if you don't have rank with someone when you have to stand your ground for anything, you do not get to stand your ground. The thing just happens. So keep that in mind. I'll take, can I Can I take one rank with Felix <laughs> instead? Yeah, 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 you can do that. <laughs> with that being said, thank you all so much, everybody, for listening to another episode of Whispers in the Sea. I've been your most humble game master, Kendo, but with me here today were my <laughs> salty sea dogs. Gus, where can people find you on the internet? You can find me on the internet. You sure can. Don't don't ever think you can't, because I'm on social medias uh, as August underscore Nobby, K-N-O-B-B-E. I am a musician. That's what I do. I like to make the music just for you. Aww. And also for me, too, because I really like doing it. And, uh, yeah, keep an eye out for, uh, for, for music. It's coming. It's a coming. Yeah. And our next salty sea dog, Hilda. Where can people find this podcast on the internet? If you look up Tales Yet Told on, I believe, Twitter or Instagram or Tumblr. <laughs> a Tumblr does exist. It's talesyettold.tumblr.com. All right. If there is anything on it, I cannot promise you that we're we're working on it. Okay. You know? And and join the Discord from any of those places by following the links in the bio and come chat with us cuz we have fun. Yeah. Please do. Marcy. Hi. What can people find you on the internet? Uh, I sure hope they don't. But um, you can find me on Twitter and Twitch at Soapy Squid, S-O-A-P-I-E-S-Q-U-I-D. Um, I kind of just post stream of consciousness and weird selfies, and I'm a filmmaker, so in time you'll get to see maybe a film in a year. Movie making, baby. Don't we love that? We're Don't making we the fucking that. movies, baby. This is the fucking Hollywood. Let's go. Hey, 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 of course, of course. And last, but of course, certainly not least, Ellis. Where can people find you on the internet? You can find me on Twitter at the handle Horror Writer, which is spelled W H O R underscore O R underscore the word writer. Uh, I post art. And then also, much like Marcy, stream of consciousness. So art and stream of consciousness and cat pictures for sure. You can see our previous editor, Bug, over on the, over on their Twitter. So go so go there. Who helped inspire the character of Eldorus. Awesome. And you can find me everywhere on the internet at Kendo Makes Films. Uh, and, and yeah, don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Instagram, just like Hilda said. You know, we love, we love talking to you all. We love interacting with you all. And uh, it means a lot. Uh, to know that anyone takes time out of their very busy schedule to come and listen to our little podcast. We're almost at a thousand, aren't we? Uh, excuse me. We broke a thousand. <gasps> We're at a Let's thousand. Like go! Five. Yeah! Thank you all so much for that. I, uh, like, honestly, like, it's super fucking rad. It's fucking crazy to think about. Right? That over a thousand of you are following, but not a thousand of you are listening. Hmm. Hmm. The, math huh. the math ain't mathin'. The math ain't math then go tell your friends to go listen to this podcast and don't start forget to, yeah let the numbers start mathing tell your friends and family to come and listen to the podcast and if you don't want to talk to them because you're anxious or don't like talking to them i get it but what you can do is leave a review on apple Podcasts, on spotify on Podchaser, on literally yeah. wherever you yeah. listen to start this start screaming in the streets <laughs> yelling yeah. at people streets. go up to anyone break into someone's homes anxious people who can't talk to their friends and can't talk to their family members yeah just run outside yeah. Yell it to the, the neighbor's house. Ready? Liars. Hey, hear, hear me out. Leave QR connect. codes everywhere. <laughs> so if you're in an apartment complex, connect to your neighbor's audio devices. Oh, there you go. And start playing our podcast in their homes. Exactly. And they'll, they'll be confused at first. Don't, don't get us wrong. They'll be confused, but they'll love it. 
Yeah, we're a pirate podcast. That's what we do, baby. Come yeah. on, yeah. I mean, you could play this. You could play uh, Strangers in the Woods. You could play uh, any of the solo games. You could play the solo games. You could play the duo games. You could play the Prayers in the Stat. You could do anything. Airdrop our podcast. <laughs> Airdrop the character <laughs> art to random people. It's on airplanes. Yeah, exactly. And when they ask you, what is this art from? You can tell them tales yet told. But before you do any of that, don't forget to go out Eat enough food, drink enough water, get enough sleep, and take fucking care of yourself. Because self-care is very important. Tattoo tales yet told on your body. (laughs) Yippee! (laughs) Tramp stamp. And don't forget to love yourself like we love you. Bye. 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 Bye Bye-bye.